Hello, Sour Fangs and Sappy Boys. My name is TB Sky. And I asked the last time I did a cinematic breakdown for one of these uh, Warcraft cinematics whether there'd been interest in a full cinematic breakdown of the old soldier short. And generally, it seems like the answer to that question was yes. And so here we are. Now, when I mentioned doing this, someone commented to me that they felt like that would be like, why would I want to do that? Because nothing happens in this short. It's just some characters standing around and talking. There isn't any sort of cool, interesting animation that, that you can kind of talk about there. And I can see why that would be a, like why someone would feel that way, and that's completely fine. And by the way, you might notice I'm messing a little bit with the colors, and I'm playing back the footage at a much higher rate uh, than it's supposed to be played back at. That's basically I'm trying to avoid the Brazilian World of Warcraft YouTube channel copyright claiming the video because they did that last time for reasons passing understanding. I don't think they were supposed to, uh, but they did, and I would like to prefer to not have to deal with you know filing a copyright dispute and waiting a whole month for that thing to resolve. B bit of a bother, don't want to deal with it. Anyway, I feel like there is actually a lot of very interesting animation to talk about in this short, but it's not flashy, it's not big, it's much more to do with the specific hard problems of how you animate monstrous characters in particular. And this is something I've always greatly admired about what Blizzard do, especially with their Warcraft cinematics, is how they animate monstrous characters while retaining, like, because orcs and trolls and stuff are monstrous, but they're also human. Like, in, in every way that matters, they are human. They have human emotions, they, they emote in human ways, they get sad with human expressions on their faces. And so as animators and as character designers, indeed, you have to strike a very hard balance between keeping the character inhuman, non-human, and keeping them human enough that their behaviors and expressions can translate in a way that we can understand. And one of the hard problems when it comes to animating tr uh, trolls and orcs is, well, there's a limit to what they can do with their mouths. Because trolls, for example, have these giant-ass tusks coming out of their heads. And I don't know, has Blizzard ever released like an anatomical explanation of why those tusks look that way? Because they look really, fr like, it looks like Sappy Boy should have like a real pain in his neck every day. Because that lo just looks like a heavy weight to carry around in his mouth all the time. Like, this like, must be like carrying around like a whole bottle of milk or something. And for Sour Fang, the same problem exists. You can see he has these giant ass fangs sticking out of his lower jaw and his lower jaw is wide as fuck. And this creates a pro couple of problems when it comes to especially animating dialogue because in order for people to speak in English, at least, they need to be able to form a certain number of sounds. For instance, when you see ah, that's just kind of, you just open your mouth, ah and you can kind of make that ah sound. And, but when you say e, you if you try and, and do it and you kind of exaggerate the motion, but e, you kind of have to pull your lips back from your teeth and you kind of have to make a smile, which is why people, photographers tell you to say tease, is because that will sort of naturally encourage your face to get into a sort of smiley looking expression. And then when you say a sound like o oh, or oo or u, you'll notice if you try to do that yourself, o, oh, you cannot do the A mouth position, like opening your mouth wide, ah, uh, and say, oh, you can't say, oh, you can say, ah, oh, at best, but you can't say, oh, because in order to say, oh, you have to constrict your lips. You have to squish your lips together horizontally to create a circular shape with your mouth to make the o, e, u sounds come out. Like it's, it's literally part of how that sound is emoted. And Sour Fang, and indeed Sappy Boy, can't do that because their teeth are in the way. They can't constrict their lips sideways. So, how do you animate a character like that talking, speaking in English? Like, because from a lore perspective, the way that you would solve this if you didn't have to actually have the characters talk or anything, if you were writing a novel, what a very dedicated linguist would do would invent a language that doesn't require any of the sounds that an orc's mouth would not be naturally able to able to form like you would have a language without the o u u sounds at all because orcs can't make those but since this has to happen in english and the mouth motions have to match the english spoken dialogue what do the blizzard animators do well in short especially for sourfang here you can see they over animate his lips massive like they do a lot of work by just moving the lower parts of his face around massively like he's saying claiming what is mine right that's 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 really all he's saying here but take a look at how much he's moving his face he's saying 
claiming what is mine. He has to open and close his mouth. He has to move his lips around. He has to distort his face an incredible amount in order to get the motion of the face to match the dialogue that's being spoken on screen. And I'm going to be harping on about that a lot in this video because this is just something that, that's, that's really super fascinating to me. There's a really good example right here. They will come for us now, is what he says to Sylvanas. So they... They try and follow along by forming those same sounds with your mouth as we go, right? They, and you can kind of see already with the E, you already kind of have to constrict your lips a little bit in a way that his mouth does not quite allow. And so the lips are doing a lot, a lot of the work trying to get those mouth positions out of him. And you can especially see it here, for instance, when he has to form the now sound, which is N, A, U. Now, now, this is why a W is called a double U, by the way, because at the end of a word like now, it's it it actually does sound like an U sound, like now, now. So na starts very open, and you can see that here, now. But then when he gets to the ooh sound, take a look at what the animators do with his lips. They do a very clever thing. They can't constrict the whole of the face into the circular O sound. So what they do instead is they take the upper lip and they pull it down behind the big fat lower lip. And in so doing, even though it's not quite the correct way to form that word in English, what they do is they manage to create that little circle shape that we need in order to create a believable ooh. Oh, sound like now, and so you get that little circle shape, that little that little sensation of okay, there's there's a circle being formed by his lips to produce that sound, without actually having the character be able to constrict their lips um, from side to side, and that's just like as as an animation trick, that's just really clever. Like he has this giant lower jaw. And you can see it again here, it's being put to use. There's so much of his emotion, so much of his behavior, so much of his mood is communicated by the motion of that lower jaw. And it has so much freedom to move around on his face. And you can see, especially here, when he says, mmm, all of them, mmm, for an, for an M sound, and, an, and indeed like a, a B, B sound, you have to put your lips together. You can't say B without without putting your lips together. You can't keep your lips and say and say, gah, gah, buh, uh. you have to say, buh, buh. and the same thing with, mm. you can't do that with your mouth open, uh, mm. you can't do it with your mouth open. So in order to emote that mm sound, which requires you to close your lips together, again, because of those giant tusks, he can't quite close his lips in a natural way. So boop, they get closed up real tight together. And that has the added benefit, by the way. Here, he's being kind of defiant with Sylvanas. They will come for us, all of them. He's angry, so he's clenching his jaw together. So the, the animators who are, who are animating this dialogue are just finding that little double trick. Okay, so we can communicate his defiance, his anger, his tension, at the same time as we find a way to communicate that mmm sound that is kind of difficult to do when you have got giant ass teeth in the way of the whole thing. Let's see if we can find something similar to talk about the sappy boy. There aren't a lot of close-ups on his face until relatively late in the short. So let's have a look and see. Uh, uh, sappy boy tends not to be in, like, a lot of sappy boy's dialogue is about how it affects Sourfang more than what he's saying. Uh, so let's see if we can find. See, yeah, see, he, he has to say, like, you. And you, you is, a, again, a, a mouth motion that really requires you to constrict your lips a lot. And so for him, the, the animators, again, f have to find a way around those giant tusks. Like, you can see his tongue moving. You can even see his tongue moving inside his mouth. And he says, like, like you. And see how see how they just managed to get around the big tusk? They just kind of ignore that they're there, so they give him the world's most elastic lips that just kind of close up around them and form a seal that allows him to do the the ooh sound. But even then, you can see it, it, it forces him to have a slight... He always has a slight smile on his face, right? It's because of the way that the tusks distort his face. It's hard to make him do an angry face. It's hard to make him have a kind of sad, mm, downward, you know, downward smiley, a sad smiley expression on his face. Because they always, they always pull his lips up. Which means that in order to make him look sad, 
the eyes have to pull double duty. And that's certainly something that the animators do a lot. Like when you look at Sappy Boy, there's a lot of stuff going on, especially with his eyes up here. You can see as Sour Fan closes in and, and he's, it, what we need here is he's shocked, he's scared, but he's also defiant. Like he's also standing against Sour Fang. So what do they do with the lips? Well, they extend them just a little bit past, like they open just a little bit past his tusks to give him that wide eyed showing my teeth fear expression with his, with, his, uh, with his mouth. But take a look at just how much, how many ridges and lines and stuff that are going on on the upper side of his face. Just how much work his eyes are doing to communicate the scared expression the kind of hurt the confused expression and then how it hardens right as he composes himself a little bit you can see that little subtle motion of the eyes and the way he kind of lowers his head and and he tightens his jaw a little bit more all of a sudden now he looks defiant right he looks like I'm, well I'm, you can try but i can take it and he's got little tears in his eyes too which is what makes him so adorable and you can see it also um in the way that uh, his lips you can see how they, you can see as he, as he steals himself, as he hardens himself, look how the, the lines appear here and here next to his nose as he flares his nostrils and he kind of tightens and he kind of tenses his expression up a little bit more in order to get that defiance that I can take anything you can dish out, big guy. I'm not going to back down from you. I'm not scared of you. Expression that, that he's pulling off. Because you, you're you limited by what you can do with the mouth. Like, so for the orc, for Sour Fang, they have to overuse the lower jaw in order to get him to make the expressions that they need. For Sappy Boy, they have to go real hard on making the eyes do the work for the expression in order to compensate for the limitations that the giant ass tusks are causing in the lower half of his face. And it's just, to me, that's just really freaking interesting. It's really interesting to see how animators solve these kinds of problems because like, when you watch anime, for example, and you have like a monstrous character in anime, there's a reason why anime has a lot of hot monster girls. And it's not just because, you know, weeps like hot monster girls. It's also because it's a lot easier to add some monster features everywhere but the face, everywhere but the anatomy that's used to do to do emotion human emotion and then just animate the character like any other human character than it is to invent a completely monstrous anatomy for the face for the character design and then asking your animators to spend time and effort and money animating that unusual anatomy finding ways around the limitations that would be introduced by having a particularly monstrous anatomy um, and especially in terms of when you want a character to be relatable and human, that's one of the things that this short does so fucking well. Despite these monstrous faces that the characters have, you see so much of the emotion, like so much of, of the the disgust and the self-hate and the and the anger and the rejection and 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 you know the the, the self-pity that's going on inside of Sour Fang comes across in his expressions. It comes across especially in the way that they frame his eyes, those bright eyes that you know are constantly giving him a kind of clear-eyed expression. So much of that is is being done like in order to make these characters emote in a human way. And that's just it's so much easier. If you don't add all that detail, if you don't add all those, you know, deformations and all that strangeness, if you just give them a completely normal human face and then give them, like, orc ears or whatever, and, and then they're a cute anime girl, like, that would be so much easier to animate. And that's always a question of, like, the, the, the tension between budget and time and quality. Like, you always have to make trade-offs and determinations against this. I'm not trying to make this, like, an anti-anime rant. There's a lot of really cool Monster Girls in anime and stuff like that, but it's a it's a question of approach. Now, Blizzard also has, like, all of the money. Like, just all of, like, all of the money is available to Blizzard to pump into these animations. They have incredibly talented animation teams. They have incredibly disciplined animation pipelines. They have an incredibly efficient, as far as I know anyway, pipeline for getting these things done. Like they have a lot of experience. They have a, they have a experience as a set, so, a couple of studios of animators working on this stuff, you know, sharing the workload. One animator, the, the animator who's doing the character animation is not the same dude who does the texturing, for example. It's not the same dude who does all the lighting, for example. That's a complicated process where the director is also involved. So one thing I want to emphasize here is, much as I am inclined to credit the character animators with just all of the reasons why this short is so good, 
animation is an intensely collaborative medium. So a lot of like, again, a lot of the, making the emotion come across for Sao Feng also comes down to the way that lighting is used to frame his face. Like I said, they like to keep his eyes clear. They like to make you able, even though he has this massive brow and these very small eyes and this very big face, they like to make sure that you can see his eyes, that you can see the expression that's being communicated by his eyes, because that's one of the best ways to keep him human, to keep him recognizably, they keep, to keep him emoting like a human. And that comes down a lot to lighting, that comes down a lot to direction in terms of what camera angles to use and stuff like that, and that's, that's a very collaborative effort. So, that's me just gushing over just how good the character animation is in these things. It is, I, I love the subtle stuff. I love those little touches. Like, for instance, like here, the, armor in Warcraft is stupid. Like, it's stupid. It is dumb. It is the, like, fantasy He-Man Masters of the Universe cheese. This is complete. Why would anyone wear something that looks like this? Nobody would. It's just, it's the dumbest thing you could possibly wear into combat. And so what the animator has to do is make it not look dumb. They have to make it not look like the kind of thing that a 14-year-old schoolboy would doodle on the back of his notebook in history class. Like, while imagining some, some, some fantasy scenario where he's the hero slaying the evil orcs. Like, this is, this is dumb armor. This is very dumb. And that's not a criticism. Like, that's part of the aesthetic of World of Warcraft. That's part of the aesthetic of Warcraft as a whole, is this hyper-real, sort of incredibly sort of cartoony, cheesy, over-the-top kind of vibe that doesn't, it doesn't mean you can't have intensely emotional moments, which is what this is, but it means when an animator has to make this moment emotional, we can't be distracted by the armor looking stupid. So what does the animator have to do? Well, they have to find a way to move the armor with the body that doesn't make it look like it's cardboard, that doesn't make it look like it's weightless, but it also can't look like it would be stupidly inconvenient to be wearing something like that while trying to cradle your dead son in the snow. And they manage that really well. Like, if you see the way that the armor kind of follows him, right? As, as Saurfang moves, you can see here as he... You can see how the armor kind of settles a little bit after he moves. He, he moves his arm forward here, and you can see how the armor, after his arm has reached its final position here, the armor keeps moving just a little bit, which communicates like the weight, the heft of it, which, which is why it doesn't look like it's made of stupid cardboard. But they're also making very sure that the armor isn't moving too much, that it isn't like bobbing and weaving and, and shaking all over the place, because that would make it look impractical and stupid. And, and again, depending on how closely you follow the motions of the character, you could make that armor kind of be a little bit more all over the place. And so there's a careful balance that has to be struck there as well of making the scene look dignified, even if the aesthetic that underlies the scene is, you know, high fantasy cheese ball stuff. And I just love that. Like, I love how good... And, I, and again, that also comes down to, the, like, the way the color is used in the scene, the way the lighting is used in the scene, the way the scene is framed from a cinematography perspective. All of that comes into play in order to make sure that that works. Although, being a character animator myself, I, I'm tempted to credit the character animators primarily. Anyway, let's talk about the plot of the short. Let's talk about what's actually happening in it, because there's... Like, I talked about that a little bit in my previous video about Sylvanas and Sourfang both, but... I want to touch on it again here, because as we open on the short, like the first thing we see is this is flashbacks that we're going to be returning to later in the short. Dead Sun in the snow, Sylvanas in the flames. So we have this, we have this juxtaposition of something he loves, something he cares deeply about, the sun being buried in the cold and the snow. So that's the identification there is like this cold, harsh, unforgiving you know, blue, like lifeless atmosphere versus the flaming inferno, like the, the burning bright fire of Sylvanas taking down Teldrassil and killing all the civilians inside. And that's just from, from like, um, from a, from a cinematic perspective, that's, that's a very good contrast to use. Like we have this memory that he cares about. That's very deeply emotionally important to him, but is also tinged with sadness. Okay. We set that in the snow. We set that in the blue and this memory of Sylvanas burning down the tree that is full of anger and resentment and, and, you know, disappointment and, and, you know, pain. Well, fill that one up with red instead. And that makes sense in terms of just whether that's also just an accident of, okay, his son was probably killed in the snow canonically. I don't really know. 
And Sylvanas was standing in front of a giant burning tree, which makes it easy to put a lot of red in the scene. But it's also a conscious choice, like because you could alternatively, instead of having the flashback being the tree burning, being set on fire in a pyre, you could also have him confront Sylvanas in the aftermath, in the, you know, in the on the bur burnt down battlefield amidst the ashes on the corpses of what has been left after after the battle is done. And then you could put a lot of grays and blues and sort of darker, more dour gray tones into the scene because it's a night scene. The embers have died away. It's not dominated by the red anymore. Whereas when it comes to Sourfang grieving his son, like, I mean, I get I don't know what happens in the lore specifically with his son, but you could have him grieving his son at a funeral pyre for his son. Like, they, they, he takes his body back to Durotar and he puts it on a funeral pyre and people are celebrating. And then you can have that scene dominated by the red of anger. Like, so there's all these choices that you can make from a directorial perspective in terms of how you want to communicate those two different feelings. But here, the sadness, the, the pain, the grief he feels is quiet. It's personal. It's not big or bombastic it is it is lonely it is intensely lonely in this scene there's only him and his son there's nobody else there but in the scene with sylvanas let's see if we can find it multiple other people are in the shot like you, you can see that there's a crowd of people sort of hanging around in the background you can see well or can you is it just corpses i can't tell not either way this isn't lonely like we've got hands reaching out we've got all kinds of all kinds of busyness going on in this scene so he's not really alone with sylvanas here it's not really an intimate moment it's it's a moment of confrontation right in the in the way that it's being framed and that's just like from a filmmaking perspective these are kind of the basics but they're also very good basics and also Sourfang opens by the thing he's doing for like most of the short is he's taking off his armor and his armor is just like full of symbology. It's full of symbology of the Horde, his position in the Horde, his position as you know, the Lord Sourfang of the Horde. I don't know exactly what he is like second in command to the war chief, whatever he's his official position is. His armor is a symbol of that. It's a symbol of his connection to the Horde. And as I mentioned before, the defining factor of Sourfang in this short, like I don't know about him in the in the game entire or in the in all those stuff that have been published, but in this short, Sourfang is a person who's burdened by history. He's weighed down by everything that has happened to him. All of these memories, all of these flashbacks, all of these, you know, conflicting emotions raging inside of him are weighing him down. They're a burden on him. They're hurting him, and he has had enough. He wants to get rid of it. He wants to get rid of that painful history, and he wants to die. So in order to do that, he takes off all of his armor because the armor connects him to the Horde. It connects him to other people. It connects him to Sappy Boy because they're both wearing the ceremonial armor, identifying them as members of the Horde. So he wants to get rid of that. And that's what he's doing for most of the short. He's taking off armor pieces one after the other, shedding them, throwing them on the floor, throwing his history on the floor, throwing his connection to the Horde on the floor and throwing his son's amulet with a symbol of the Horde on it into the fire. It's not subtle at all. So that's that's that, that's the symbology of what Sourfang is doing. But what's interesting about the dynamic is how Sappy Boy over here follows it, like what his actions do to reflect on what Sourfang is doing. Because the first thing Sappy Boy does when we see him is he gives Sourfang a salute, and then he does a small act of kindness. Oh, the fire is is almost burning out. Well, it's going to get cold up here, and we w we want a little extra light. I will give you a little extra light. And Sourfang doesn't want this. He doesn't want light shed on him because he's in the dark. Like, literally, the scene opens in the dark. He's in the dark here. Like, the, there's, the light is over here. It's very faint. It's barely, you know, lighting up the side of him. Most of him is in shadow because he is darkened. He is in a dark mood. He is in a dark place. And so the first thing Sappy Boy does when he arrives is he tries to bring a little light back into Sourfang's life. Like from from a from a cinematic direction perspective, that's just really good. Like that's just that's just very competent. That's just a good way to do it. And Sourfang, from the first moment that Sappy Boy shows him kindness, Sourfang is trying to reject it because kindness would mean connection. Kindness would mean being connected to the horde, being connected to other people. And as we see from his memories, his connections to other people keep bringing him pain. His son is dead. Sylvanas is a terrible war chief who's killing innocent people. And it hurts. He doesn't want connection. He wants to be alone. He wants to die. But Sappy Boy 
is a challenge to that, a challenge to that loneliness. And that's that's what I really like about the symbology of taking off the armor, because Saurfang is just taking off his armor because he wants to go and die. Like, he wants to commit suicide, so it's a utilitarian action. It's easier to die if you're not wearing a bunch of armor that's going to protect you from the arrows and the, ar and the weapons of the enemy. But it's also a symbolic action that's, that symbolizes his attempt to divest himself of history. But then what happens um, as we get here is that Sappy Boy follows suit. He mirrors him. He says, okay, we are not, we're not sharing the symbology of the Horde. We're not sharing this, this um, symbological connection to the Horde between us. That's not the thing that ties us together anymore. I'm going to take off my armor like you so that in my nakedness, as it were, in, in my lack of being armored, I have that connection to you. I'm the same as you. I am also taking off my armor. I'm connected to you. Even if you don't want to admit it, even if you reject it, I want to be connected to you and you are connected to me. And that's what the visual language of the short is saying is that Sappy Boy is forcing Sour Fang to realize that connection. And that's very much what happens in this moment here, by the way. The Horde, it's all we have because that's what the Horde is supposed to be about. Like, that's that's the thing that Sylvanas has committed a crime against. The Horde is all we have. That's very much the, the, the place that the Horde has occupied in Warcraft lore for the Orcs and for all... Of, they, it's this union of all these disparate people, the Tauren, the Orcs, all of them, coming together into one unified whole to be a people, to have a connection, to find... To build a history together, to build a nation, to build a connection, to build a togetherness, a community, a society. That's very much what the Horde is about, and especially for Sappy Boy, who has lost his father. His father is gone. It's The Horde is the only connection he has left. And so, a son without a father approaches a father without a son and tells him, We're not connected by blood. We're not related, but in the Horde... We can be a family. We can be like each other. We can be connected. And in those connections, we can find, you know, healing and, and peace and some measure of honor. Even if that's taken away from us by circumstance, we can always have the horde. We can always have each other. And from an emotional perspective, I'm getting a little bit misty-eyed just kind of spelling it out right now because I'm... I'm tremendously vulnerable to father-son narratives. It's something, I don't know, I have an emotional weak point for that specific kind of storytelling. A son without a father and a father without a son becoming a family through the horde, through connection. Like, and that's just... Again, from a storytelling perspective, this is a short. Like, this is six minutes of not very much happening at all. And yet all of this stuff, all of this loaded symbology all of these all of these ideas are nonetheless very much part of it and you can see it here in this confrontation between sour fang and sappy boy is that there is no enmity there sappy boy isn't trying to hurt him he's trying to you know <laughs> re-include him in the family he's trying to bring him back into connection to to force him to think about something more than himself to think beyond his own needs to stop caring only about the weight of his own history and realize what the weight of history means to the Horde. The history that they have together is all they have. Which is why, the moment the standard comes up, we get our first glimpse of sunlight. Sunlight, the thing that has been missing throughout the scenes entirely so far. Now we see it here, shining down on the battle standard of the Horde itself the symbol of that connection, of that family that Saurfang has been very, very strongly trying to get rid of because it's been hurting him. But the sunlight hits it and, it, you know, it illuminates the Horde and it illuminates what the Horde means to him. And there's a very strong visual connection being drawn between he looks at this the, the battle standard of the Horde and then he looks at Sappy Boy. So... They are the same thing. They are both symbols of what the Horde means. And what the Horde means is... There's a kid here who needs a father. There's a child here who needs a father figure to look up to, to teach him, to protect him, to help him. And there's a father here who desperately needs a son to help. That's what the Horde means. That's what it's supposed to mean. And that connection is reinforced so strongly that you wouldn't believe it when Sappy Boy pulls out 
Sourfang's own son's amulet with the symbol of the Horde on it and offers it to him in a symbolic, you know, reconnection of that father-son relationship that was broken by the tragedy in the snow. Sappy Boy is reconnecting them as father and son in the Horde, and that's... It's just really good. Like, Blizzard are really fucking good at this stuff. They're really good at creating these narratives. They're really good at I applying very complicated, very meaningful emotions to cartoony green, blue, orc troll people. And here in the moment when Saurfang accepts connection, he accepts that they are connected, that they are one in the Horde, that they are a family, well... The sun goes up. The sun comes up. Sunlight finally illuminates the scene fully. The dawn has come. It has dawned on Sourfang what the reality of the Horde is. And he's now prepared to face death, not as a suicidal charge, but to protect his family. Which is why he says here at the end, his last thing is... Like, Sappy Boy says, let's die together. And then Sourfang is like, without armor? The armor that he was trying so hard to get rid of, that was a symbol of his like being weighed down, of being like held in place by the horde, of being, being trapped in these old terrible memories. He's ready to put it back on. Not because he's he, he wants to be in those memories, not because he wants to be part of those painful memories, but because he needs the armor to protect Sappy Boy, his new son, as it were. It's just really good. Like, I really, really like this short. I really like how many complicated emotions it gets across in such short a time. How much it tells us about who Sourfang is as a character that, more than anything else, the thing that defines Sourfang is that he's a father. He's a father to his dead son, but also a father to the Horde. A father to the lost orphans of the Horde, of all the other people who have suffered loss in war. That's the other thing that connects Sourfang and Sappy Boy, by the way. They have both lost family in the war, right? They both had that same shared trauma. And by connecting over that shared trauma is how they find their way into courage, into, you know, healing, into becoming better people. It's just, it works really well. It's, once you get into it, and the animation is gorgeous, but just the, the, the way it uses its cinema, like the way it uses the animation, the cinematography, and the visual symbols of the thing to tell the cohesive story about who Sourfang is, what he's going through, what kind of emotions he's going through, and what what's hap what Sourfang means to Sappy Boy. That's a lot of complicated shit to get across for this guy. Like like Sourfang has a long history in World of Warcraft. He's done all kinds of shit. He has like lots of dialogue. There's lots. Of, he's been in novels and shit. People know stuff about Sourfang. People didn't know shit about Sappy Boy. He's a new character, so we have to get across a lot about who he is in a short time. The animation does that. The the the, the use of dialogue, the use of visual symbols do that very, very effectively. So just kudos to Blizzard. I, I'm, I'm just gushing now, so let's just end this right here. If you like this video, there's a like button down below, and I encourage you to click on it because, you know, something something algorithm i don't understand it but i've been told that that is necessary there's also a subscribe button and a bell icon next to that subscribe button which is the actual subscribe button because the subscribe button is not a subscribe button anymore it's more like a polite suggestion to youtube that maybe you want to see some of the videos so there's all of that it's also if you want to help me keep making videos like this and gush excitedly over cinematic shorts that are meant to be advertisements for a video game well I do have a Patreon. If you have a dollar that you don't need or that you're willing to part with, then I would be very grateful to have that dollar because it allows me to do stuff like pay rent and buy clothes and other things that are good to have when it's cold outside and you don't have a hoard to keep you warm. Anyway, if you didn't like this video, I... I mean, I... If, I mean, if you didn't like it, I... I I don't know how to... It's just... I, I mean... I mean, I'm sorry, okay? I, I did my best. Thank you very much for watching.